Now, there is a way that uh, a man might be required to prove that his daughter was a virgin at the time when she got married. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses number 15 and forward. Recently, we got all hyped up about the Aksa Parvez uh, murder, and we're wondering, what does that have to do with Islam? And some people are thinking, well, yeah, that's Islam's teaching. You know, honor killings all over the Muslim world. What are Muslims doing? They're following the Quran. They're not following the Quran. The Quran, in fact, prohibits Muslims from taking innocent life. And uh, taking a life for what people call honor killing is actually... Uh, dishonorable murder, as far as I can understand from the Quran. But we can see that in the Bible, there is some hint of uh, something that we might call honor killing. Just listen. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses number 15 forward. Then the girl's father and her mother shall take and bring out the evidence of the girl's virginity to the elders of the city at the gate. I should preface that by saying, that's in case her husband says, when I married her, she wasn't a virgin. The girl's father shall say to the elder, so apparently the father saves uh, some of her garments from the wedding night, uh, perhaps stained with uh, uh, material that will show that she was a virgin at the time. So now he parades it before the elders of the city to prove that his daughter was a virgin. The girl's father shall say to the elders, I gave my daughter to this man for a wife, but he turned against her, and behold, he has charged her with shameful deeds, saying, I did not find your daughter a virgin, but this is the evidence of my daughter's virginity. Imagine how shameful that must be for the girl. And they said, they shall spread the garment before the elders of the city. So the elders of that city shall take the man and chastise him, and they shall fine him a hundred shekels of silver and give it to the girl's father, because he publicly defamed the virgin of Israel, and she shall remain his wife. He cannot divorce her all his, all his days. But if this charge is true, that the girl was not found a virgin, then they shall bring out the girl to the doorway of her father's house, and the men of her city shall stone her to death because she has committed an act of folly in Israel by playing the harlot in her father's house. Thus, you shall purge the evil from among you. You see, why she brought to her father's house to receive her death penalty? Because this is how you purge the evil. Because she has defiled her father's house, and now the name of the family must be cleared. And the same thing goes, or slightly differently, for a priest's daughter. Leviticus chapter 21, verse number 9. Suppose a priest's daughter makes herself unclean by becoming a prostitute. Then she brings shame on her father. She must be burned to death. Why? You see what's happening? She brings shame to her father. You can understand that around the Mediterranean basin in ancient times, this was a very common way of viewing things. You bring shame to me, I uh, eradicate myself from that, uh, I eradicate that shame by putting an end to it in a very decisive way. A poor girl is, uh, is killed. Jephthah. Jephthah. I don't know how many of you know, know Jephthah. We didn't learn much about him in Sunday school. Uh, in Judges chapter 11, uh, then the Lord's Spirit took control of Jephthah, and Jephthah went through Gilead and Manasseh, raising an army. Finally, he arrived at Mizpah in Gilead, where he promised the Lord, If you let me defeat the Ammonites and come home safely, I will sacrifice to you whatever comes, or whoever, rather, whoever comes out to meet me first. Then eventually he gets home, because he's destroyed all of these armies by the help of God. And when Jephthah returned to his home, this is verse number 34, in Mitzpah, the first one to meet him was his daughter. She was playing a tambourine and dancing to celebrate his victory, and she was his only child. Oh, Jephthah cried. Then he tore his clothes in sorrow and said to his daughter, I made a sacred promise to the Lord, and I must keep it. Your coming out to meet me has broken my heart. Father, she said, you made a sacred promise to the Lord, and he let you defeat the Ammonites. Now you must do what you promised, even if it means I must die. But first, let me spend two months wandering in the hill country with my friends. We'll cry together, because I can never get married and have children. Yes, you may have two months, Jephthah said. She and some other girls left, and for two months they wandered in the hill country crying because she could never get married and have children. Then she went back to her father. He did what he had promised, and she never got married. What a nice way of saying it. And she never got married. Of course she never got married. That's why every year, uh, Israelite girls walk around for four days weeping for Jephthah's daughter. So, we can see then that in, in short, there is something about honor killings actually in, in the Bible. Clearer than this is Deuteronomy chapter 13, which speaks about an apostate in your own house. If one of your family commits apostasy, what are you to do? You are to be the first ones to stone the apostate in your own family. 
So honor killings is very old, it predates the religion of Islam, it's not condoned by the Quran, but uh, we can see that in fact, uh, I don't know what they called it back then, but it looks like the kinds of things I'm looking at in the Bible right now uh, is similar to what we are referring to as honor killings in our present time. So you see a lot of times people uh, misunderstand, they blame the Quran for something that it does not represent and Muslims of course might be better followers of the Bible than they are of the uh, of the Quran. But you know I, I don't want to commit any excesses here. I only prepared this to to meet uh, Dave on his own ground because I've read his books and I've seen the kinds of approaches that he takes.